All right, welcome back everyone to another GoLab 2020 speak um, talk. <laughs> I am the speaker, the talker, uh, talk manager, I should say. And we are about to watch the recorded video by Federico Paulinelli called Shipping Your Tests in a Container for Fun and for Profit. Let's bring him on to say hi to you all really quickly before we get started with the video. And there we are. Hello, Federico. We can Hello. see you. <laughs> Great to have you here. Nice to be here again. Um, Absolutely. So for those of you who don't know, I'll tell you about Federico here. He works remotely for Red Hat. And uh, being part of the CNF networking team, he contributes to networking features of OpenShift relevant in the telco context. Uh, before that, he has been building complex distributed systems for finance using C and then in Go. His current interests are related to Go and modern microservices architectures. He is also a contributor of Athens, the dependencies proxies for Go. And about this talk we'll hear just now, um, it's a practical experience talk on how we slowly converted several test suites scattered in different repositories in a product sized container that allows customers to validate the uh, deployment of their platform. We don't always work on SAAS applications. One example is the rapid growth of Kubernetes clusters in edge scenarios, where the workloads in those environments require extensive testing. And on top of that, clusters in far edge locations are small in size, but large in numbers, and deployed and managed on site by human operators. Uh, to make things more difficult, some of the most complex and mission critical deployments also don't have internet access, so it's not immediately apparent how to test them. Having a way to validate on-premise deployments and report feedback to us saves time and reduces mistakes during the deployment phase. All right, before we watch the video, did you want to add anything to that or are we ready to go? No, I guess we already, um, you already described what the talk is about. It's the first time I give, I speak about something I did. Generally, I speak about um, technologies. Um, it was fun. I hope the, the audience will enjoy it. Yeah, yeah. So absolutely. Let's uh, sit back and enjoy the talk. Stay tuned until the end for the live Q&A with Federico. Um, if you do have questions during the talk, you can definitely ask them in the Q&A chat. It's the one with the question mark. It's not the help button. So please ask your questions there just to keep things organized. All right, everyone. See you after the video. See you later. Hello everyone, thanks for attending this talk. Um, today I'm going to describe how we took a bunch of end-to-end -end tests, we put them together in order to build a validation tool for um, on-premise de um, deployments. Before starting, I wanted to thank the GoLab organization for putting together this event um, and I really hope we will meet in person anytime soon. Before starting, some quick words about me. I'm Federico. I work for Red Hat, remotely from Pisa. Uh, before that, I was working for a local fintech company for quite a long time, doing uh, distributed systems in the, in the financial field. And now I'm part of the uh, CNF networking team where we um, modify and contribute to the OpenShift platform in order to make it possible to run uh, telco-related applications uh, on it. Aside from that, I am passionate about open source. I contributed to a bunch of projects. Some of them are Firefox for Android and more recently in the field of Go, the Athens um, Go dependency proxy. My Twitter handle and GitHub handle are both Fede Paul, 
uh, and also my email. Uh, so if you want to provide feedback, to reach me out, to say that you like this talk or have questions, uh, feel free to reach me out. I'll try to reply as fast as I can. So let's start with the problem. Uh, the problem uh, is we, we try we are trying to solve is that not all the applications are software as a service. Um, so not every one of us has the luxury of being able to access the production environment to fetch data from it to understand what's going on when something uh, is not working. The picture is a bit extreme. Uh, we don't deploy clusters on top of antennas, but almost. In our case, uh, we deal with uh, bare metal de deployments on, on bare metals um, using specific hardware related features and not all the installations uh, look like the same. And in this scenario, you don't have control on the environment. It, so when whenever you get uh, an issue back, it's hard to reproduce uh, it, your uh, lab environment may look different from and may behave different from uh, what the field look like the things i'm going to cover uh, are not kubernetes specific i try to keep this talk uh, a bit higher level so you could steal the ideas uh, that we implemented and possibly use them in uh, in other fields so having a way to validate a deployment uh, has obvious advantages in terms of support. If we intercept failures or bad deployments right after they happen, then the time saving is huge compared to when you find out that the deployment wasn't sane, like when the production is running, for example. So. Let's imagine that we ha ask somebody this tool for, for this, doing this type of validation and the char characteristic that it has to have are those listed in the slide. It, it must be easy to use. We must have something that we can give to users, not to developers. It must validate the system as a whole from outside. Um, and it must produce a report that we can read back and it must not be intrusive. It doesn't have to mess up with the environment because that particular environment is what the customers are going to use in production. So the, the first building block are end-to-end -end tests. We, we already had a bunch of them it's scattered across different repositories related to different um, features we, we care about. And end-to-end -end tests are different from unit tests uh, that we are um, used to write. End-to-end uh, -end tests are meant to run against the system as a whole, not test a tiny section of the code. They use real data. There is no mocking involved in end-to-end -end tests. Then they interact with the, with the system using uh, only the public API. They act as a user. The only point of contact, they don't care about the implementation, they care about what you see from outside. Um, again, it's different from unit tests in a, a good way and in a bad way. In a bad way because they are slower, unit tests are meant to be super snappy uh, with, and they use uh, often mocks for being uh, so quick. End-to-end tests are slow and they are also less deterministic because if you have a distributed system with a lot of moving parts and you trigger something and you have to wait for something else to happen, well, you have to actively wait for, for that something to happen. You, you don't know how long something it's going to take. For example, in Kubernetes, you spin up a pod, you wait for it to be running, and you don't know how long it, it's going to take. It may be one second or five seconds. Um, so yeah, th these are the, the challenges and the difference between end-to-end -end tests and like the unit tests we are used to. The flow of the tests is more or less 
like this one, you do some kind of configuration uh, that you want to verify. You wait for that configuration to, to be applied. You wait for some feedback, for some resource that tells you uh, what I did uh, was applied and then you validate, you verify a, a, a certain behavior that is working as you are expecting. For end-to-end -end tests in the Kubernetes ecosystem, there is this Ginkgo BDD framework, which is the standard de facto uh, for, for Kubernetes projects. It's um, a testing framework that has some characteristics that makes it really um, a good fit for what we are building here. Again, what we are describe what I'm describing could have been done like using the standard Go testing library, which I like a lot. But Ginkgo has some features that, that makes it like perfect for this. Um, this is how a test looks like. There is this. Hierarchical, uh, hierarchical um, definition of a test. There is the outer section that tells you what um, this whole set of tests is about. Then there is these inner layers uh, up to the it, which is the, the real implementation of the test. And this is how one of our tests look like. There is the, the outside that so is telling that we are testing connectivity, we are giving uh, a context to the tests, and then we test several things. And you can also see here that there is support for table tests as we like to do in, uh, in regular Go tests. Ginkgo comes often together with Geomega. Geomega is a matcher assertion library, and they are a they fit well together, but you can use them uh, independently. And Geomega has these um, eventually assertions that are perfect in the context of end-to-end -end testing, where when again you have moving parts and you have to do active waiting. For example, in the example I, I said before, you run a pod and you have to wait for it to, to be run. To be running and this eventually construct uh, allows you to verify that a given condition is true uh, like within a given timeout so you, you can say i want the pod to be running uh, in 30 seconds uh, with the polling interval of one second ginkgo has a few nice points that uh, are pretty useful in this context. Uh, the eventually helpers, as I already mentioned, there is also the consistently one that verifies that a, consi a condition is consistently uh, happening for a given time frame. So if you want to say, uh, I want the pod to be running at least for uh, the next 30 seconds, that's how you do it. They have a nice and readable output, which is something that your users will appreciate the the output reads really well you if you write the name of the test in a proper way uh, the output will tell you what a given test is doing they have a pluggable architecture so one thing is that you can inject these kind of reporters that um, intercept the execution of the test and may uh, produce uh, extra output that we are going to use for several purposes. And another nice thing is that you can compose different tests belonging to uh, different repositories inside a single test suite by uh, simply uh, anonymously importing the, the, the package that contains the tests. And finally, uh, there is out-of-the-box support for generating an executable out of a given test suite. And since we want to ship the, the tests in some way, uh, having a, a single executable that contains everything is really good. So you have all this stuff and you want to provide one single thing to your user. You want to have 
one single uh, deliverable that contains all the stuff you want. And that single deliverable uh, in, in, in our approach is uh, a container. So what you should do, what you should put in, in that container, uh, the test binary um, produced out, out of a single test suite or many test suites, some utility tools you may need, um, documentation, uh, and also you should uh, have and document uh, the different entry points you want, the, the different executables uh, you are shipping with inside your container and a common uh, CLI entry point for, for handling them. Um, another thing we did in our case uh, to stress out this single container thing is that in our case we are uh, running pods in, in the test environment for uh, doing various tests and even in those pods where, where you run a container inside of a pod the image used for those containers is the same image that contains the test. So it's all packed together in a single container. One thing you have to understand is that the environment uh, your tests are going to run is not your uh, friendly lab environment where you know the ins and out and where you can inspect and that you know that you, you deployed uh, properly. So one thing that may help is having a high level, uh, more generic, uh, quicker sanity check test suite that verifies the building blocks, that verifies that the, just the core services are running, that do a quick check that the deployment is what you are expecting. And you want to run this before the real thousand or more tests that, be, that compose the, the real test suite uh, just because this would provide a better output to the, the user. Uh, you can say, hey, this service is not running, which is a lot better than providing 500 tests failing for um, obscure reasons. So if this preliminary step fails, then your whole test suite should abort. This is because you should not trust the user. Um, they must say, yeah, I installed it properly, I, I upgraded to the right version or the services are running, whatever. You want to be sure that this is true. And this is because uh, you want to do this preliminary validation that will save you a lot of time. Um, another thing that uh, you have to know is that any environment will be different. It's not like when you have the, your lab environment or a copy of your single production environment and you shape the tests to fit that environment. Here you may have dependencies on the hardware. You, in our case we support different hardware vendors, different uh, devices. Um, you may have different database types uh, or whatever. So the tests in, in this case must be a bit smarter. There must be this uh, preliminary um, inspection phase where the tests look at the environment and try to understand uh, what's there and adapt itself, adapt it, its behavior depending on what is on the environment. And then you run the test. So this makes the test a bit more flexible on one hand, but it, it also makes them a bit more complex. Another thing, another big plot twist uh, from what you are used to do when you run your end-to-end uh, -end tests at home is that in, in, in your home, in your lab, in your CI, you build, you spin up an environment uh, to run the tests again, and then you throw it away. Here, the approach is completely different. Here, you are running your end-to-end -end test to, uh, against an environment because you want to validate it, because somebody is going to use it right after that. So, 
your test you should be act as a boy scout um, just because the environment you are testing you are testing it because it's important because somebody wants to understand that it's running uh, it's uh, configured properly so you should be sure that you clean leftovers if your tests apply some configurations to verify like some behavior you should make sure that all those configurations are cleaned again because here what we are doing is trying to validate an environment because you want to make sure that it's working we stressed this concept uh, even more introduces introducing this um, we call it discovery mode is something that you can enable under a parameter and if you do that the test don't even apply configuration the test uh, verifies if a given configuration is on the on the deployment if it is there then they try to leverage it in order to perform the the test they need to do and to verify the behavior they expect to the the, the system to have but if the configuration is not there, the test just skip and provide a valid motivation for skipping. So in this case, you are even more respectful of the system. You are not messing up with the configuration. In theory, you could run this against a cluster that is already running uh, production workloads because you are not changing anything. You are just part of the system in this case. So and. This is something that you may want to consider uh, depending of, on the type of validation you want to do. If you want to validate like the system right after the deployment, then you, you are able to, to shuffle all the configurations possible. If you want to validate a system like right, right after it's configured, but before running um, production, uh, env uh, production workloads, you don't need, you, you can't, uh, change the configuration. So this is something you should be aware of. So now the the tests that started as code uh, as uh, uh, like tests for 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 code are part of a product. Is something that you are shipping to a customer. Uh, so you must version the image. You must version the tests. You must distribute them uh, under uh, the regular channels, but more, most important, you must ensure the, their quality because uh, you don't want to have false negatives. You don't want to have a test that says uh, this uh, deployment is not working, uh, not because it's not working, not because there is a bug in that, but because they are faulty. So you must ensure the quality and you must test the tests. And the way we did it uh, is to have them as part of uh, uh, our CI. Instead of we, we validate each single feature with the local end -to -end tests uh, belonging to that feature, but we also have a global CI uh, that instead of using the code for, uh, for validating the, the, the product, which is the cluster, um, we use the image as a, a user would with the same parameters uh, in order to do this kind of validation. So on one hand, we are validating the, the product, the, the OpenShift cluster with the extra features we care about. On the other hand, we validate the image to be working. And again, having this version, this bo both the product and the image version and having CI is the only way to ensure that it's working correctly. At some point, uh, your customers will ask you, what are we test doing? What are you doing against? What are you verifying? So you may want to document this, this uh, list of tests. And we all know that if you stop and write documentation the day after you write it, uh, that the, there will be a drift between the documentation and the, the reality and the behavior of the code because we care about the code, not so much about documentation. So one way to avoid this is to have an automatic way to document the code. And in, in case of Ginkgo, 
Uh, a nice way to do that is using the output. The output is uh, pretty verbose, and if you name the test correctly, then you you'll have uh, in a dry run uh, in a dry run you will see what it's each test is doing. Um, on top of that, you should aim uh, to uh, automatically generate documentation from 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 the tests. And since now, uh, again, it was a general description of what we did. Uh, and now I'm gonna uh, try to describe more in detail our uh, implementation approach. Here in the bottom is the repository I'm referring to that we, it started like uh, as a test suite, then it, it evolved uh, consuming other tests from other repositories and ended up being uh, this, uh, this tool that we deliver to customers. We have several features in these examples. Uh, we have SRV and PTP, which are two features we care about in the world of telcos. Uh, they belong to different repositories. Uh, each repository uh, has its own end-to-end -end test suite that consumes the local tests inside a different package. And these structures is particularly important because then on the, on the repo I just mentioned, we have another test suite that is global. It contains some tests that do not belong to any features or they are just integration of a different set of features. And apart from those local features, uh, so sorry, from those local tests, we also consume the tests uh, local to other repositories, the one uh, here, by anonymously import them. So whenever you have a test suite and you import some, some tests from uh, any path, those tests will be run as they belong to the test suite. And this is a way that Ginkgo allow you to compose different tests coming from different repositories. This has some advantages. There is a bit of overhead. If you want to fix something uh, in one of those uh, external repos, you have to fix it there as you would do in, with the library. But the advantage is a more consistent output. You have a single test suite. You can filter or skip uh, off it, everything looks better from a user perspective. We have three different test suites. Uh, remember the, the validation step I spoke uh, in, in the beginning where you want to ensure that um, the deployment is good from a high level perspective. That is a separate test suite. Then we have Another one for configuration, uh, for doing high level configuration. And the, f the last one is for running the, the real test, the detailed ones. All the tests are tagged. In all general section of the test, we have the, the name of the feature uh, the, the tests are about. And this allows the user to say, I want to test only this subset of the features. And this particular uh, convention is respected both on the end-to-end uh, -end tests, but also on the other steps. So uh, by doing that, you can tell, I want only, uh, let's say, PTP, which is one of the features to care about, and that parameter will be read from, for each of the steps. So the validation will only validate the PTP feature, the configuration will configure only that part, those particular bits, and the same for the others. Each single test suite generates a binary. Um, this is part of the Docker file. We use Ginkgo build to, to produce the binaries and we put them somewhere. The entry point, the whole suite that is the composition of these three uh, different test suites is just a bash script that iterates over them. The, it takes the, the input of the file and it passes to each suite. So again, if you say I want to filter only PTP, then that parameter will be passed to each single of these uh, three test suites in, in the suites list. And again, this results in a consistent and 
maintainable behavior. The image contains extras, not only the tests and the entry point, which are the first four lines, but in case you run some pod that needs to have some specific behavior or some specific uh, executable, we put it in the image. And also any additional packages we may need for, for any pods, uh, regardless of the test uh, it's about, because all the pods are, are, uh, launched from all the tests use this very same image. And also the, there are like external tools, uh, such as the mirroring one that I'm going to speak about, even those kind of external tools that allows you to prepare the test environment are part of the image. This, for example, is a totally Kubernetes related utility function that we put in the image. In our case, the environments we are dealing with are bare metal clusters with no internet access. So what we expect is to have um, an external host where the user run the test from that has access to the internet and also has access to the cluster. Uh, the cluster normally have an internal image registry and what this mirror uh, facility do is to take the images from the internet, from the public registry and to copy it to the local registry to the cluster and then there is a, another way to instruct the test to fetch the images not from the default location which is the public registry, Quay or Docker Hub or whatever but from a different configurable registry. So this is a way to be able to run this kind of test in, even if in a disconnected environment. Another super, super important thing to care about is how to collect reports, how to collect feedback. The final worst thing you it can happen is to have a failure that is, is happening only somewhere, only on a given deployment uh, that you are not able to reproduce. So you may want to have a way um, to understand and have as much details as you, uh, as you can from a failure. And the way we did it was to use a custom Ginkgo reporter. In Ginkgo you can uh, inject these reporters that are a set of callbacks about test executions, you do it by uh, appending them to a list and passing to the to the run command. And in our case, uh, the source code is in the repo at the bottom. Uh, what we did was to skip. We, we only care about failures, and whenever a failure happens, we take a, a picture, a snapshot of the state of a lot of resources. We are taking a lot of logs of different pods right after the failure and this uh, snapshotting right after the failure is super important because if you try to understand that from uh, like when all the test suite finished and not like uh, just right after the, the a single test failed the state can go anywhere because all uh, what these tests do is changing configuration and rearranging things and checking different things. So you making a picture of the, the state right after the failure is super critical. And the way we do it is to append it to a, a, a given file that we can ask to customers. For documentation, uh, another important thing to remember is that we are giving these not to developers but to users so the the level of uh, behavior you should document is a bit higher even if you are using like low level construct maybe your users care about filtering uh, uh, to a given feature for example so you you may want to say hey if you want to run all the ptp related tests you have to pass the, this parameter even if this parameter is the low level one that lets you um, also focus on, on a single tiny test. So what we do is uh, we documented the Ginkgo filter parameter, but not for running single test, but for uh, providing the, the set of the values that you can pass to it 
to focus on a, on a given uh, on a given feature on a given set of tests basically and finally again super important tell them how to provide you feedback in case something is is not working correctly for uh, each test documentation, uh, as I said before, we are striving to have the code as the source of truth. And we do that by using the JUnit output. We also have this JUnit reporter that comes out of the box from Ginkgo, produces a standard JUnit XML file. And from a dry run, we parse it. We, we use it in, uh, together with a Go template and we produce a markdown file that contains all the list of the tests and all the description of the tests taken from the name and from uh, an additional map. And we are running this as part of our CI. So if somebody else uh, add a new test, we try to generate the markdown. If the markdown is different from what we, uh, what we uh, committed in the repository, we know that there is some, uh, some disconnection and CI fails. And this is the only way to ensure that um, that the, the, the documentation is uh, on par with the code. Because if you do it manually, again, the documentation will drift and the code will be will go to another way. And they, they won't be uh, well aligned. And it will require you a lot of, of effort at some point because the, the users will uh, find out that uh, the documentation is not telling what the tests do. Um, yeah, so wrapping it up, uh, we are giving this box to the customers. So what we put in the box? Uh, sadly, uh, not the internet, uh, as this picture uh, lets you think of. If you saw uh, the IT Crowd series, um, this is a reference to it. Um, yeah, th this part is pretty hard from not doing it live, but anyway, uh, we put several executables, one for each test suite uh, in, inside the container. We are doing a northern uh, execution of these of this macro steps. We want to have a verbose uh, failure report. This is super important. Uh, having a way to collect feedback is critical. And also one thing I forgot to mention is that if you have your CI and you have this report and during the development you have failures, you should strive to use the report as a way to um, triage the bugs in, in, in your CI. If you are not able to use the report, just the report to triage failures, then it it will mean that you won't be able to do that uh, in the real uh, um, when when your tests are running in in a customer premise. So this is the most important thing you, you should care about. Documentation. I just said how to generate uh, the documentation automatically, and finally inside the box you want to put the extra toolery. You want to have this single box that contains everything that is used in many different ways for running the test. And with that, that is all I had for you today. Um, I think, um, again, it's a bit weird for, from uh, a virtual perspective, but I think there will be some live questions uh, for my future self uh, in a bit. So thanks again for attending. I really hope this uh, will help you in a way or another if you encounter this same problem. Thanks again. Everyone, welcome back. I hope that you enjoyed that. We are ready now to go live with Federico to answer any and all questions that you have. So without further ado, let's bring him online.
takes a moment. There we are. Hello, Federico. Welcome back. <laughs> Hello. Hi. It's really awkward to see you recorded. <laughs> it is. Yeah, I know that feeling. Definitely. Um, in the last part, though, you said that you may have some future questions that you might answer later. Uh, were there any that you found? Uh, no, no, no. I, I was saying that uh, I was anticipating there, there was going to be a Q&A, which is the Ah, okay, sorry, I misunderstood what you said. All right, yeah, well, uh, before we proceed with the Q&A, uh, which you guys, if you have questions, go ahead and write them down. Um, I just want to say again, we are so happy to have you here at GoLab, even if it is virtually and not in Florence. <laughs> um, is there anything that you wanted to say about your participation in GoLab? Uh, not really, it, this, this is my third time Speaking at GoLab, I really like the event. It's on on live. It was so vibrant. Now we are losing a bit of the atmosphere again, yeah. but the the, organiz the organization is always spotless. I wanted to thanks them again. Thank you for your praise. Definitely, yeah. We yep. hoped that this year would be live, but um, you know, all we can do is cross our fingers for next year's yep. event and hope it goes well. In any case, we hope you are there, even if it is virtually next year too. Let's hope not. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, I'm not seeing any questions yet. I wonder mm, if anyone had anything they would like to add, if not questions for him. I'll give everyone a moment. Uh, let's see. It seems that there are no questions at the moment. Mm, how about anything that you are looking forward to? maybe for upcoming things? Uh, you, you mean in general or? Uh, no, not necessarily, but uh, I don't know, with containers or with uh, shipping them if there are. Yeah, any... basically we, this was kind of something that evolved by itself because mm -hmm. we were being asked for validations of on-premise environment, which, which is something that doesn't always happen. A again, a lot of people are working on a single instance product that you have access to and their life is like super easy. And in, in this case, we are on the opposite side of the spectrum where we are like uh, giving our software to customers. They are deploying them it by themselves in a lot of locations in a lot of instances and they wanted to have a, a way to do to verify the deployment and so we came out with this approach that maybe can be useful for any other people that have the the same the same issues so yeah that, that's what i wanted to share is it was more mostly that the approach uh, as opposed as like the solution for our specific product, because I feel I, I felt that uh, it was something common to to many people, and I didn't find any um, any pre-built solution for 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 this. So. All right. Uh, I, I think I see a question. Yes, yes, we have lots of them coming in. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so uh, first one is from Lisa, who says, thanks for your nice presentation. Do you use one container for the tests between multiple environments or one for every environment? Uh, no, we, we are using one single container for all the environments. Again, the tests are a bit elastic. Uh, as I described in the in the Chamelon slide, so they they are meant to adapt themselves to the configuration they are uh, they are testing. Um, another thing is the behavior. So in in, in one like uh, flavor of the test, the test try to apply all the given all the different configurations to to have um, to have coverage. To, to verify all the possible configurations. If you toggle that discovery mode parameter, they will try to leverage the existing configuration on, present on the environment. And so they don't mess up, they won't mess up with the configuration, which is uh, more suitable for a, a production ready environment. But apart from that, the image is the same. 
and we are also using that instrumenting our CI. All right, thank you for that. Um, let's see, we have another question. I think we saw it already in your presentation, but someone is asking where you where we can find the slides. Uh, okay, I, I think, okay, I can share the private link because my, I didn't put them on speaker that uh, speaker that yet. Oh, okay. Let let me try to find the right link. Sorry about this. Okay, can I copy it on the? Should chat? be fine, yeah. If you want to link that okay. in the room chat, okay. Excellent. This is the link to the okay. Thank you so much. All right, no worries. We have another question here from Elon who asks Have you seen Kubernetes clusters uh, running on edge, edge devices themselves, for example, on a Pi? Uh, I heard about those, I never tried them. It, it's something that sounds really interesting. I've heard about people running the, all the sort of applications like in a home environment on a Kubernetes cluster, which I'm not sure I would do, but uh, because of the maintenance uh, hurdle. But yes, I, I heard about that, uh, about those. I never tried those. Mm. Okay. And for, for the second part of the question, what we like are aiming to are more uh, production grade environments running, uh, yeah, basically mm, productized uh, applications. So not like uh, Raspberry PIs. Okay, thank you. I think that was our last question. Let me look really closely to make sure there was nothing I missed. No, I think that's that's about it. All right. Well, if that was the last question, I just want to uh, thank everyone for their participation, for watching, and of course, to our speaker, Federico, I hope we get to have you again in the next year of GoLab. Yep, thank, thank you again. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. We'll see you around. Bye-bye. <laughs> All right, well, we have a few more talks. And before we go on to them, I just want to remind you all that you can rate this talk on the agenda page. Uh, definitely, if you have any feedback, we really appreciate that always. So we'll be waiting for you for the next talk of the day, which is at 4.50 p.m., so just a little over 20 minutes for no, yeah, 20 minutes from now. Uh, and that is easily build healthy and reliable web apps using metrics and tracing. So hope to see you then. Bye.